Yo, what's up, friends? Everybody good? All right, good to see you. Welcome. Thanks for crashing a party. My name is Nathan. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, if I hadn't had a chance to meet you, hello. Uh, if I have had a chance to meet you, hello again. Nice to see you. Everybody joining online, so good to have you. Thanks for being with us today. I don't know if you've noticed this, uh, how much you pay attention to pop culture, but I'm starting to notice a trend. Uh, I'm starting to see that there's some uh, pretty uh, culturally influential people that are being changed by Jesus. And the uh, cool part about it is they are not bashful to talk about it. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you've seen this list of people. Rob Schneider is one of them. I don't know if you're familiar with Rob Schneider. Um, he was a, uh, he's, an, he's an actor, but really he's known for playing the like raunchy, sexually explicit, inappropriate, crude humor, like funny guy in all of the movies that he has starred in. And, uh, but man, in the past 12 months, he made a decision to follow Jesus. Here's a quote. He said, if I'm gonna lead my life and be an example as Christ compels us to do, then I have to do it. Even if it hurts, even if it stretches how I used to feel. And he talks about forgiveness like this. He says, once you forgive someone, the beautiful thing about forgiveness is you end up feeling better as, long, or as well as releasing them of that offense as well. Jesus looked at Rob Snyder and said, you can do it. Shia LaBeouf, number two, um, you probably heard about this guy. This guy not only uh, made a decision to become a Christian, this cat right here got ordained as a deacon in the Catholic Church. I didn't even know that was a thing. But here he is with his new squad here with his boys. Um, and here's the quote from him. He said, I became a Christian man in a real, very real way. I could have just said the prayers that were written on the page, but it was a real thing that really saved me. Check this out. It's a full-blown exchange of heart, a surrender of control. Jesus proved to be quite the transformer in Shia's life. Next person, Chris Pratt. Any Chris Pratt fans in here? Oh, easy, easy ladies, easy. <laughs> Calm down. This guy's been a Christian um, for a while. He was a successful actor in some of network television's funniest shows, but also a part of a, a lot of blockbuster hits over the summer and um, over the past 10 years. So he gave an, a speech at an award show in 2018, and he listed uh, 10 things you need in your life if you want to succeed. And here was the first one. He said, God is real. God loves you. God wants the best for you. Believe that, because I do. People are going to tell you that you're perfect just the way you are. Well, you're not. You're imperfect. You always will be. But there's a powerful God that designed you that way. And if you're willing to accept that and to accept him, then you can receive grace. And that grace is a gift. And like the freedom that we enjoy in this country, that grace was paid for with someone else's blood. Now, afterwards, he, this kind of coming out of, of his faith on national TV, the press asked him a couple of questions about it. And he said this, he said, it's authentic for me to be pro-Christian, pro-Jesus. That's my thing and I like it. Even the star Lord eventually meets his Lord and savior. Hulk Hogan, <laughs> what are you gonna do, brother? This is awesome. This is happening <laughs> in the last couple of months. This dude is 70 years old and he posted a, a video on his Instagram of getting baptized in his church. And here's the caption that he placed on, on Instagram. Total surrender and dedication to Jesus is the greatest day of my life. No worries, no hate, no judgment, only love. Denzel Washington, maybe the most famous and prolific African-American actor of, of our time, uh, has been uh, known for being an outspoken Christian for a while. He was speaking at a commencement speech uh, at, at a graduation, and he said, I want to give you three things that are going to make you successful that have made me successful. So he told him to write them down. He said, number one, put God first. Put God first in everything that you do. Everything that you think you see in me, everything that I've accomplished, everything that you think I have, and trust me, I have a few things. Everything that I have is by the grace of God. Understand that, it's a gift. I've been protected, directed, and corrected. I've kept God in my life and it's kept me humble. He always stuck with me. So stick with him in everything that you do. If you think you wanna do whatever you think that I've done, then do what I did and always stick with God. Jesus was Denzel's great equalizer. The last one is Justin Bieber, your boy and mine. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I looked up a story, uh, read his like conversion experience, but, but a story that I found about a, a, a lady that he actually led to Christ was most interesting to me. Um, there was a, a lady named Mandy who worked as a stewardess on Justin Bieber's private jet. 
and this was her quote. He says, he, he gets on board, Justin gets on board, and the first thing that he says to me is, do you believe in Jesus Christ? I looked at him and I said, excuse me? And he said, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe he's the son of God that was crucified and died for your sins? And do you know that you've been forgiven? Mandy said this, I had never heard anyone just put it so simple. Mandy explained that Bieber said, Jesus is the son of God that died for you. It's just as simple as that. Jesus died for your sins. Mandy later ended up giving her life to Christ. And the next time that she saw Justin was when she was working on his private plane again. Less than a year later, he was walking on the flight and she was standing in the middle of the aisle and stopped him and told him that she had given her life to Christ. She said, in response, Justin celebrated the moment and prayed with me right in the aisle of the plane. Uh, multiple actors on the hit TV show, The Chosen, also have shared that they came to faith in Christ because Justin Bieber invited them to his church and they heard about Jesus and their life was changed. Even the believers are becoming believers. Let's go. <laughs> they write themselves at this point. Now, I don't know uh, about you. I don't know if I just have a healthy dose of skepticism or that I have a desire to trust everyone yet verify everything. But sometimes I read those stories and I'm like, really, really? Every now and then you'll see somebody that had a wild life before Jesus and it seems like they have a really fast overnight quick change and it just makes you scratch your head. Man, maybe not for you, but like for me, that's, that's what I, I, really, I really think about. Like, are they for real? Because I've seen some really famous people claim they love Jesus and then not later on, like they changed their mind, they switched teams again. Maybe it was financially beneficial or they were trying to increase their, their reach or their influence with a Christian crowd. But man, I can't help it. And maybe that's been you. Maybe that's not you with famous actors or movie stars, but maybe there's been times in your life where you've taken a step back and said, hey man, is, is this real? I've had people come up to me that, that gave their lives to Christ six months ago, a year ago, and they'll just come up to me and they ask me, say, Nathan, can you, can you tell the difference? Like, can you see it in me? It's almost like they're wanting to make sure that it's legit. Like, I just want to make, I know I said the thing and did the thing, but like, I just want to make sure that you see, that other people can see that my life is different, that my life has changed. And so it's kind of like a legit check. It's like, is this faith actually for, for real? Now, no one will honestly be able to answer that question for you. The only person that can see your heart and knows your intentions and motives are God. And, and so I'm not here to judge you, but I, I can read the scriptures. And it's very clear that when Jesus begins to change your life on the inside, then there is no doubt about it. There will be things on the outside that will change. There'll be things that people will be able to look back and say, hey, you are not the same person. You don't act the same. You don't talk the same. You don't look the same. Like there's something about you that is, is very different. Now I'm in no way saying that you are saved by works and that your outward change and outward actions are what gets you a relationship with Jesus. I'm just saying that if Jesus really changes your life and you have an authentic faith in him, then we're gonna be able to see it. There's gonna be things that, that happen that we're gonna be able to observe. And, and that's what I wanna look at and we look as, as we look at a story in Acts chapter eight today. I wanna to introduce you to a guy by the name of Simon. You may have never heard a sermon on Simon before. This dude was a magician. But I don't want you to think David Blaine, like sleight of hand, that dude you found on Facebook that came to your daughter's birthday party and did magic and pulled a rabbit out of the hat. I'm not talking about that dude. We're talking about dark magic. This is a guy that practiced voodoo, that really, really sold his soul to Satan so that he could perform certain signs and miracles and wonders, and he was really popular for it. And so in Acts chapter 8, we're going to read the story of, of Simon, and we're going to be able to learn a few things. Man, I, I want to challenge you on six things today. There's six questions that I want to ask you. If you want to know if your faith is legit, if it's real, like if you have ever asked yourself, or, or maybe you're trying to figure out somebody else's faith and you're like, man, this, I want to believe it, but like what, what makes a true faith? What makes faith real and authentic? I want to ask you these six questions out of uh, Acts chapter 8. If you have your Acts book, you can go to it. It's on page 46. Or if you have the app, all the notes will, will be there. Here's how the story starts. Remember last week we left off. Stephen was the first martyr of the New Testament church. Um, they stoned him to death, not Colorado brownie stone, but literal stone him to death. And the guy that oversaw it was Saul. We read that in Acts chapter 8. And Saul approved of his, Stephen's execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. 
And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Verse four, now, now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Here's the first question that we learned from Acts eight. Are you gonna stay faithful when life gets hard? You wanna know if you have a real faith? Ask that question, answer that question. Do you stay faithful when life gets hard? And when you pick up in chapter eight, uh, it should remind you of something. It should be a red flag. Like it should be, hey, we've never seen this before. Persecution? Like the church is is being persecuted. Like that is not what we signed up for, right? Here's what we signed up for. Signs, wonders, and miracles. That's what Jesus did. That's what the apostles have been doing. Man, I signed up for Peter and John showing up in court and outsmarting all of the lawyers. I signed up for these guys busting out of jail. I signed up for like, people being healed and raised to life. Now, like that, that's what I signed up. But persecution, the Bible says that Saul was walking into homes that were owned and occupied by Christians and he was dragging them out by the hair, like men, women, children. If he found out you were a Christian, he'd come to your house and, and, and some people were killed and executed and some people, women and children were sold into slavery all because they were a Christian. Like, I don't know, rewind back to the time where you came to the membership class. I don't remember that being written in the pamphlet. Join here and then lock your door. Look out for Saul. That's not what I signed up for. It's been really good in the church up until this point. Man, again, miracles, signs, wonders, power, man, incredible influence. Church is growing by the tens of thousands at a time. And then Saul shows up to persecute them. This was a a pivotal moment for the early church, but it's a moment that you and I have to wrestle with as well. What happens when things go bad? What happens when you pray and you don't get an answer? What happens when you make a decision to take your faith in Jesus seriously, but now all of a sudden you're you're still not married and you still can't find a job and, and your marriage hasn't changed overnight and your kids are wild and crazy and everything not seems to be getting better, but seems to be getting worse. You gonna stick with Jesus? You will if your faith's real. You won't if your faith's not. It's amazing to me that these Christians, it says that even in the midst of persecution, they they had to leave their homes. Like we have to leave the house and the furniture and everything that we own and flee out of the city of Jerusalem. And the Bible says that every house they passed on the way out the door, they were like, hey, knock, knock. Do you know about Jesus? Jesus can change your life. I've only got like two minutes to tell you the story because there's a guy trying to kill me, but I'm gonna tell you real quick. Their faith never faltered. What about you? What happens when you're doing the best that you can? You're coming to church, you're reading your Bible, you're giving faithfully. You're trying your best to do everything that God calls you to do. And then a family member dies. And then you lose your job. And relationships begin to suffer. And it just doesn't feel like life is working out like the way that you you thought it would be. You're unemployed, you're struggling financially, your family and your marriage is on the rocks. But you're trying, right? Right? You're trying. You're doing everything that you know. Why is the guy that's living like hell catching a break? And it seems like my world is falling apart. Why does it look like sometimes when you look out into the world, the bad guys are winning? Where are you at in that, God? Where are you at when I see evil and suffering? Every one of us will be faced with a moment where our faith will be tested because life won't go as planned. And you'll have to answer the question, Do you stay faithful when life gets hard? Are you gonna remain faithful to Jesus? For the church, this was a huge hurdle for them to face. It was a gut check for them. This is the time where they could have decided a few months into the life of the first New Testament church, they could have said, hey, we're packing it up. (laughs) It was fun while it lasted, man. It was a good run, okay? Signs, wonders, and miracles, I'm in. But persecution and Saul and, and, and at any moment, somebody could kick the front door of my house down just because I'm a follower of Jesus. Yeah, no, nah, I'm good. I'm going back to, to what I was doing. Got a decision to make, man. Thankfully, these people stuck with Jesus even when, when life got tough. And in verse five, it says, now Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. 
when they heard him and they saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was so much joy in that city. Man, like we're at exorcism point right now. Like people in Samaria are like demon possessed. Philip shows up preaching a message, like screaming, screeching, people are getting delivered. Like this is wild times. Second question I wanna ask you is this, do you love those people? It says that the Jews, this early New Testament church were pushed out of Jerusalem and one of the stops that they made was Samaria. Now, what you might not know about Jews and Samaritans are they hated each other, couldn't stand each other. Uh, Jews considered Samaritans half-breeds because some Jewish people that turned their back on God went to Samaria and began to intermarry with the Samaritans there that didn't love Jesus. And so they considered them like knockoffs, like you're, you're not, like you're not, it's racism at its worst. And I know like our culture today would like to tell you that, you know, like the racial divide and the, the, all of this stuff that's going on is unprecedented. Like tell me you made a D in world history without telling me you made a D in world history. It's not unprecedented. It's been so much worse. Like this is not a new game that Satan is playing. These people hated each other. Now imagine what happens when Jesus changes your life and then he calls you to those people. You gonna go? Because most people that were Jewish would have looked at the Samaritans and said, man, I know the message of Jesus will save you from hell. Honestly, I want you to go to hell. (laughs) Like, Like I don't even like you. I can't stand you. I hate you. We are on the opposite team. So I'm not going to go and tell them. But when Jesus changes your life, all of a sudden they had a burden in their heart to even go to their enemies, the people that they didn't like. So a question for you and I is, who is your Samaritan? Who are those people that you just can't stand, that you don't like? Our culture likes to put us in different camps to divide us, white people against black people, citizens against immigrants, MAGA Republicans versus progressive liberals, you against your mother-in-law, rich people versus poor people, like anything. I don't know who you don't like, but when Jesus changes your heart, he takes away that and you begin to have a burden for those people. Not a burden for them to switch teams and, and think what you think ideologically, but a burden that there are people that don't know Jesus and if they died today, they would be separated from him for eternity. Do you love those people? Those people that think and act and talk and dress and live their lives differently than you do? Will you love them? If you have authentic faith in Jesus, you will. Philip went to the very place that everyone hated and everyone hated the people that lived there. His entire life, he was ingrained with this, you hate the Samaritans, that race is inferior. And Philip shows up and he's like, hey, I got good news. Your life can be changed. Jesus can can do that. When Jesus changes your life, it replaces racism and sexism and classism and divide with care and compassion and a desire for people that are far from God to come into a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. That's just what happens. Second question, man, is your faith legit? You can prove it by loving those people and having a heart for them. In verse nine, we meet Simon for the first time, um, but there was a, a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip and seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Two different times we read in just that short amount of verses that everyone in the city of Samaria thought Simon was great. This is just an all-around good dude. We like this guy. He can do signs and wonders. He helps people, right? He leverages what he's done as dark magic in order to gain influence and popularity, and he's done that. Everybody loves him. Two times, not only does it say that they think he is great, but two times it says they pay attention to him. Like everything about this guy, I like him. 
Like anything he says, I believe. Anything he have, he's a part of, like I want to be a part of. He's just an influencer and, and, a, and, a, and a, a mover and shaker in that community. And the third question that I want to ask as we meet Simon is this. Do you know Jesus or are you just a good person? Because that text says that Simon was a good person. He was great. And just an upstanding citizen on the outside. Sometimes I'll, I'll talk to people about their faith and I'll just ask them a question, man, like, hey, if you were to die, would you go to heaven? Do you think you'd go to heaven? Like scale of one to 10, how, would you go to heaven? And people that tell me yes, I'll ask them, well, why do you say that? And the overwhelming response is like, well, I'm, I just feel like I'm a good person. I just feel like I'm, I'm better than the majority of people. Like I'm a good person and I don't believe God would keep good people out of heaven as long as you're good and you try hard and you're, you kind of got some morals and values and you try to help others when you, and it, you know, like, if you outweigh like 50% of the people in the world, like I've never killed anybody, like never done anything too crazy that anybody knows about. And so like, I'm good, right? That was Simon. Everybody, rich and poor, young and old in the whole town said, man, this guy is good. Surely he's gonna make it. And if your faith is based on how good you are, you ain't gonna make it. <laughs> There's only one way to heaven and that's through Jesus. It's not through trying, it's through Jesus. It's the only way that your life can be changed. And so if your faith is, is built on that, like you gotta understand man, your faith is built on you, not on Jesus. It's pride. It's I'm a good person. It's I'm good enough to get in. Oh, well, I've done enough good things. Oh, well, I'm, I'm kind of good for other people. I'm nice. I, I try to do the right thing. I pray occasionally. I'm a member of a church. I read my Bible some doesn't have anything, hey, I'm glad you're a good person. Doesn't have anything to do with you and Jesus. Doesn't have anything to do with your eternity. Philip makes it clear here that Jesus doesn't make bad people good. He makes dead people alive. Like you don't have a good, pro bad problem. You have a, you are dead in your sins problem. And as long as you stay dead, you will never have fullness of life in Christ. And so like, you don't, you don't need a behavior modification. You need a resurrection in your life. So Simon was convinced, oh, well, yeah, I'm already good. If that's what your faith is built on, then you don't have faith. Now, if you're a good person in here today, you don't like that news <laughs> because you were thinking, shoot, man, I thought I was good. Like I just thought that as long as I did the right thing and, and tried to behave, then Jesus would love me and, and God would accept me. And so that's bad news for you. Now, if you're a bad person in here, that's really good news for you. Like you're like, oh shoot, this whole time, I thought I was too bad for God, that God would never love me, that God would never accept me. So you mean to tell me that it doesn't have anything to do with me? It's all about Jesus. It's not works-based. It's all faith and, and believing that, that Christ is Lord. That's it? That's all it takes to join? You don't have to be a good person for your salvation to be legitimate? It's not about you. It's all about Jesus. Simon lived his entire life thinking it's all about me. I just want to be good and great. And Philip shows up and is like, yep, nah, doesn't have anything to do with you at all. Verse 14, now when the apostles of Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they, they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, <laughs> check out what this cat did. He offered them money saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. So like there's a revival breaking out in Samaria and Peter and John and the disciples get word of it. They're like, hey, we need to send in some reinforcements. Like what is happening in Samaria of all places to those people of all people? And so Peter and John roll up in there, sons of thunder. Um, and here's the question uh, that I wanna ask you that we see in those verses. Do you love Jesus or do you love just what Jesus has done for you or what Jesus does for you? The Bible says that when Philip uh, preached the gospel and, and Simon gave his life to Christ, here's what it says in the end of verse 13. He was amazed at the signs and the wonders. It doesn't say that Simon was amazed at Jesus and what he had done for him. I'm amazed because of what Jesus can do in your life. Later on in these verses, he comes up to the disciples. He's like, all right, real talk. I wanna do what you just did. When you laid your hands on someone and like, demons are exercised in people's lives and, and the lame walk and the blind see and the, the deaf can now speak. I got to have that. <laughs> like, I want that 
right there. He didn't want Jesus. He wanted what Jesus could do for him. And a lot of people want that. Here's the problem. If your faith is built on that, the first time Jesus doesn't give you what you asked for, you're out. I've talked to people that said, hey, I prayed and I asked God for something and he didn't give it to me and that's why I don't go to church anymore. That's why you haven't seen me in months. Like it's not real, it's, it's not legitimate. And I just like to tell them, oh, so you don't, you don't love Jesus, you just want what Jesus can do for you. Okay, so you didn't have faith in the beginning. Let's start over. <laughs> I didn't even realize I wasn't talking to somebody that wasn't even a Christian yet because that's not what real faith is about. That's not how it, that's not how it works. He didn't follow Jesus because people's lives were being changed. He followed Jesus for what Jesus could do. Hey, I need a healing. I need a miracle. I need some provision. I need a blessing. I need something in my life to become better. Man, this is really cool. My life could be better if I had Jesus. I could do all of these things that these apostles are doing. What's your faith based on? Is it based on who Jesus is or what Jesus does for you? Because Jesus is not a genie in a bottle. And he'll let you rub that lamp all day long and be quiet if that's what you're looking for. But you pursue a person and find Jesus, then you'll find everything you're looking for. And that's what our faith is built on. Verse verse 20 says this, but Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter for your heart is not right before God. Repent therefore of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven of you. For I see you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Peter, uh, probably as no surprise to you, gets a little fired up and his mouth uh, starts to run. Now, the English translation of what Peter says is the PG version, and so I'm gonna give you the rated R version. Uh, so I'll go back to the Greek, and, and what it says is, in the English, he says, may your money perish with you. A, a, a more, that word perish, a more literal translation would have been Peter walks up to Simon and says, to hell with your money. Like, screw it, I don't need your money. That's not how this thing works. John's probably like, all right, calm down, Peter. <laughs> it's not good for preachers to cuss, okay? It's not, it's not the look we want. But like Peter is fired up about it. He's like, no, 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 you're not gonna buy, you can't buy your way to Jesus. That's not what faith is. Like you can't give me money and, and me pass this on to it. But here's the fifth question I want you to wrestle with. Do you want Jesus, but you don't wanna change? Because here's the problem. All of Simon's power up until this point was gained that way. He would find someone that knew had, how to do dark magic. He would make a deal with him. He would pay him or, or like sell part of himself to someone that followed Satan. And in exchange for that, you received power. So everything that he could possibly do was either a deal with the devil or he paid somebody to teach him how to do it and like impart the power. So here's what Simon was doing. I want the benefits of Jesus, but I don't want to change anything about my old life. And that's not what Jesus does. Man, for us, we say, man, I want to be a Christian, but I don't want to stop doing any of the things that Jesus tells me not to do. I don't want any part of my life to be different. I don't want to have to be selfless. I don't want to have to be generous. I want all of the benefits with none of the responsibilities, and that's not how it works. That's what Simon wanted. And there comes a point in our lives as Christians where there are things that, that, that we need to remove. There are seeds that we need to plant. There are weeds that we need to pull. There are snakes that we need to, to kill. And if you're not willing to kill the snakes and pull the weeds, then your faith is going to come into question. People are going to realize, man, you wanted Jesus, but you don't want Jesus to change any part of your life. Change everybody else's life, but, but Jesus, don't, don't change mine. He wanted to mix his old life with his new life. And the Bible says that's not how it works. Man, when you give your life to Christ, you are a new creation. You are born again. The old has passed away and the new has come. It's totally different, totally different. But Simon, one of the best of, of both worlds. Is there any part of your life that you're holding on to? And say, hey, I know I'm trying to blend my desires and my opinions and my life and, and my direction and my dreams and my hopes and my goals with what Jesus has called me to do. It just doesn't work like that. Here's how Simon responds, last two verses. And Simon answered, pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now, when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many of the villages 
of the Samaritans. Last question I want to give you is this. Do you know about Jesus or do you know Jesus? Do you know about Jesus or do you know Jesus? Because Peter looked at Simon and gave him specific instructions. He said, hey man, I need for you to pray and repent of your sins and ask God to change your heart. And Simon looked at Peter and said, hey, can you, can you talk to him? Can, can you pray? Why? Because you know him and I don't. Yeah, you got a connection with him, right? You, he'll answer your call. I don't know him. He's gonna do you a favor. He doesn't know me and I don't know him. And so like, why would he do that for me? Simon's letting it out of the bag. I don't know this guy. You talk to him. You seem to be pretty close to him. I mean, we can do that in our life too, right? We need a favor. So we find somebody that knows somebody and like, hey, can you reach out to him? Can you send an email? Can you tell me who to talk to? Can you open up the door? And that's not how it works. God doesn't have any grandchildren. It's all sons and daughters. You can't go through someone else to get to God. It's just you and God, man. It's gotta be personal. So do you know about Jesus? You know all the answers. You've been to Sunday school your whole life. You've attended church. We do Bible trivia. You're the guy we want on your team. I'm not asking you that. Do you know Jesus? Do you have a relationship with Jesus? Simon didn't. I'm not saying he wasn't saved. The Bible says in verse 13 that he believed. Here's what I think happened. He walked in and and the Bible says that when Jesus knocks on the door of your heart, open it up, Jesus comes in, you walk through the door. Here's what many Christians do. They walk through the door of salvation and spend their entire life in the foyer of the house. And they never move past that. Paul calls them baby Christians. They never stop drinking the milk. They never get to the point where they can eat and feed themselves. They're eating the meat of the word. That's how Paul describes it. I like to look at it as a house. And yes, yeah, some people, man, they walk into the front door and they're saved and they're baptized and somebody slaps them on the back and there's a highlight reel video and everybody goes crazy and that's it. That's your story. And for years, you stand in the foyer of the house and there reaches a point where you get tired mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. And what you don't realize is that there's a bedroom in the house with a nice bed where you will find rest, but you've never moved past the foyer. And we can begin to be spiritually hungry in our lives. Not even realize that you're standing in the house and on the other side of the wall, there's a kitchen that is full of food. But if you never walk into the house, you never move forward. You never grow deep in your relationship with God. You've got an entire house at your disposal and you're perishing in the foyer because all you did was walk in the front door. That's why for us, man, it's so important to join a small group and to to grow in community together. Simon took the first step and then he didn't know where to go. Didn't take another step. Until the end of the story, he was like, can you step for me? Can you do it for me? I don't know what to do. I don't know who he is. I don't know what's going on. Man, do you know about Jesus? All the answers, all the trivia, you know all about the Bible. I'm asking you that. Do you know Jesus? Do you know him? That's who your faith is built on. Not what somebody told you, not what you learned in a book in Sunday school, but like a personal relationship with God through, through Jesus. It's not just about evangelism and telling somebody about Jesus and them getting baptized and and that's it. Story's over, slap them on the back. Good luck, figure it out. No, it's a lifelong pursuit every day, every day becoming more and more like like Jesus. The reason why I think those six questions are important is uh, you gotta answer those because heads up, verse one in your life is coming. There's gonna reach a point where your life begins to fall apart, where you face some struggles and hardships that you've never faced before. And you can't wait to figure out your your faith then. It'll be too late to cram. You gotta answer the questions now. Have a real faith now. So that when those times come and your faith is tested, then you can do exactly like the New Testament church did. They can face persecution head on and not just survive, but they can thrive in the midst of it because they had a true, authentic faith. Man, I hope you wrestle with those six questions today so that you can know, know that you know, that you know, that you know, that you know that your faith is legit and Jesus has authentically changed your life from the inside out. Let's pray together. God, thanks for this story in scripture, giving us a warning from guys like Simon, but also a challenge from men and women that were a part of the early church. Gotta pray those six questions would resonate in our hearts and minds today, that they'd be etched into our souls as we understand the foundation of our faith is found in Christ alone. God, give us the wisdom to know what to do with the words that we've just heard and the courage to take the next step this morning. I ask and pray those in your son Jesus' name. Amen.